Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our virtual um, book lovers brunch. My name is Christine Muir. I am the community librarian at Cary Library. I am recording this event for people uh, to watch later, whether you um, aren't able to stay for the whole thing or whether somebody registered and couldn't attend. This is being recorded. None of the attendees are on camera, so uh, there's no privacy issues in that sense. The uh, people watching the recording will only see those of us who are panelists and speaking today. All of you will get a link to the recording afterwards and you're welcome to share that with anyone you like. And in that follow-up email with the video link, you'll also get a link to a survey. The library would like to know not only what you think of today's program, but what other programs you might like to see us offer. As I mentioned before officially starting, the chat is open to you um, all the time. So feel free to use that. I will be monitoring the chat so I can answer any questions for you about the technology or the format of the program. There will be time for questions to the authors at the end of the event, but I would ask that you use the Q&A button for that section uh, so that we can more easily keep track of the questions that get asked and answered. So there's a Q&A button for that and we will answer those at the end of the program. Both of the author's books are available for purchase from the Concord Bookshop. I am going to put that link in the chat right now so that if you are inspired during the talk to uh, read the full book, you may do so. There is the link for that. Um, and I just have to tell you, it has been so much fun to plan this with Ethie Slate, the president of the Friends of Cary Library. We had originally started planning this for March. And as we all know, things happened. So that couldn't happen in person. So I'm really excited that we were able to do this for you today. And I am now going to turn this over to Ethi to introduce our authors. Thank you, Christine. Good morning and welcome everyone to the Friends Book Lovers Brunch. And Christine, I know earlier said, I hope all of you brought a cup of tea, cup of coffee, uh, some kind of a snack. And I know we will all be muted, so there'll be no background noises. So enjoy whatever is sitting beside you. As Christine mentioned, I am Ethel Slade, the president of the Friends of Cary Library. On behalf of the library and the friends who are sponsoring today's program, we wish, and wish to welcome all of you and our special guests, Martha Aikman and Julie Dubrow. As Christine mentioned, we are really appreciative of Martha and Julie joining us today, because as, as you recall, some of you had signed up for the April program, which would have had Julie and Martha with us in person with their new books for you to see right then and there and lots of good food. So unfortunately the pandemic changed that and we're really very grateful to Julie and Martha for joining us virtually today. Before I introduce our speakers, I'd like to take a moment just to thank all of you who are members of the Friends, donate to the Friends or purchase books from our stores, our sales before the library had to close and who now are purchasing bags of books available at the library's front entrance for $5 a bag. It is the proceeds from these that enable us to help the library purchase new books, purchase museum passes, offer today's program, and help fund other library activities for adults, teens, and children. For those of you who are unfamiliar with us, we hope you will consider helping us support the library by becoming a member and buying a bag of books. And Christine is putting our website up in the chat box. So after today's program, come take a look and come join us. But now on to the reason why we are all here today, and that's to talk about Emily Dickinson. Our authors bring two very different and fascinating perspectives. From having read the books, I know we are in for a wonderful morning. Martha Aikman, whose book is up, and the author of These Fever Days, 10 Pivotal Moments in the Making of Emily Dickinson, provides us with a glance into Emily Dickinson's life. Martha is a journalist and writer who writes about women who have changed America. She's been a longtime member of the Gender Studies Department at Mount Holyoke College, where she has also taught a popular seminar on Emily Dickinson in the poet's Amherst home. And I hope Martha will share some of that experience of, of teaching within at, um, in Emily's home itself. Her essays and columns have been in the New York Times, Boston Globe. She has been a frequent New England public radio commentator 
and featured on CNN, NPR, and the BBC. In addition, Martha has two other earlier books, which I also recommend. Julie DeRoe is the author of After Emily, as you can see on the screen, Two Remarkable Women in the Legacy of America's Greatest Poet, which explores the complex, and I have to say, sometimes eyebrow-raising story <laughs> of how Emily Dickinson's poetry came to be published after her death. Julie is a professor at Tufts University, where she holds several positions, including in the Department of Child Study and Human Development. She's a senior fellow in the Jonathan M. Tisch College of Civic Life and director of the Center for Interdisciplinary Studies. Her writing can be found in numerous publications, including the Boston Globe and Huffington Post. She also is the author of an earlier book, and it's now my pleasure to turn the program over to Martha and Julie. So enjoy. Martha and Julie, it's all yours. Thank, thank you very much, um, Effie and, and Christine. It's a, a pleasure to uh, be with you this morning and with people um, uh, out, outside of the Lexington, Boston area. I just saw one of my uh, pals, um, Eva Murray from San Francisco. Julie, you I'm sure you know Eva and, and her work on Emily Dickinson. So uh, we're joining people far and wide. And thank, thank you so much for joining us. Um, Julie is, is uh, kindly posting some uh, photographs up here. We thought we might take a few minutes uh, at the top to just orient people to uh, Emily Dickinson's story. This is uh, um, called The Homestead. This was where Emily Dickinson was born and, and died. Her dates are 1830 to 1886. And where she wrote the bulk of her uh, nearly 2,000 poems. It's on Main Street in Amherst, uh, on the old Boston Post Road. She saw a lot of life out in front of um, the house, as it was a um, a busy a busy road uh, with a lot of commerce. Uh, the train station was off to the right. Um, Emily Dickinson's bedroom, for those of you who aren't. Uh, familiar or haven't made the trek out to Amherst is uh, the upstairs left windows there. And she had a, she had prime real estate. Not only did she look out on that busy road, but uh, uh, she also looked to the west and and got so many beautiful sunsets. Julie, if you want to go to the, to the next slide, uh, this is also uh, a home where Emily Dickinson lived in Amherst. From the time she was 10, um, and until she was about 25, the family lived at, at this house, beautiful home um, that was just around the corner from, from the homestead. And uh, it no longer stands. Um, people familiar with Amherst say, oh, th this is uh, Emily Dickinson's mobile station home. Uh, <laughs> it's where a mobile station is now. But it was just around the corner. The reason um, the family moved is, is that they uh, things were getting a little cramped. They shared that first home with another family. And as the family grew, Dickinson had an older brother, a younger sister, they moved here. And then once the family fortunes uh, solidified and, and uh, Edward Dickinson, Emily's father, uh, was able to earn a little bit more money, he moved back into that uh, the homestead, which was the family manse. It, it was built by, by her grandfather. Maybe the next slide, Julie. Um, this is the house right next to the homestead and it's called the Evergreens, a beautiful home in the Italianate tradition. These are two uh, really lo lovely homes next to each other. And this is where uh, Emily Dickinson's brother, Austin, uh, and her sister-in-law, her beloved sister-in-law, Sue, lived along with their three children, right next door, connected by a path that Dickinson said was wide enough for two who love. So um, the, the two homes formed a, formed rather formidable property. It said something about the, um, the position of, of the Dickinsons in their lifetime. And today, uh, the Evergreens and the Homestead now form the Emily Dickinson Museum in Amherst. So once we're able to get back on the road again and people are able to travel, I, I really encourage you to, to take a look. I should also say, um, I know we're going to go into this a lot more, but um, uh, Dickinson wrote, depends on how you count, uh, 1,789 poems. Some people make an adjustment a little bit. It kind of depends on what you uh, determine a poem is. And she shared the uh, vast majority of them 
with her sister-in-law, Sue, who, who lived in this home. So um, I'm sure we'll get into more about it, but I, I, I want our, our, our viewers to be thinking about the, the letters and the poems that traveled between these, these two houses. Um, uh, Emily and Sue, her sister-in-law, called that, that route between the two houses, the Pony Express. Uh, and the next one. Uh, and this is a lovely um, view uh, looking to the east from the center of town. The Dickinsons frequently walked um, up street, as they said, to the center of town. But it gives you a, a, a sense of, of what, what that walk looked like. Um, the house uh, in, the, in the background, the first one is the Evergreens and, and the next one of course, is, is the homestead. Um, I'm sure we'll be, we'll be talking about uh, Dickinson's world. And I, I wanna make two points of that before um, we move on to some slides that, that Julie uh, will share. Um, Dickinson's world is really two things. Um, first, it's the world outside that, that window, you know, the literal world, the way in which she and her family were deeply immersed in the culture and the politics of Amherst, Massachusetts, and a world beyond that. Uh, most people know that Emily Dickinson was a recluse, uh, and that is true up until a point. Uh, what, what people often don't know is that Dickinson traveled uh, twice to live in a boarding house in, in Boston uh, when she was being treated in her 30s for an eye disorder, for an eye disorder. She happened to be there when uh, Lincoln was uh, reelected. She happened to be there when Lincoln was assassinated. Uh, two times of great uh, tumultuous uh, uh, historical events. Um, and then she also made a sojourn to Washington, D.C. Her father was a congressman, served one, one term uh, in, in D.C. She visited him there, went to Philadelphia. So recluse to a point, but also a, a much wider world. And the second point that I just wanna make about Emily Dickinson's world is, is, is the internal world, uh, the world of, of, of her mind. And uh, we get our, I think one of our greatest insights into that by um, examining Dickinson's letters. Uh, not only was Dickinson a poet, she was also a remarkable letter writer. And uh, uh, we have uh, three volumes of her letters and they were a, an enormous uh, resource for me. Um, Julie. Thanks, Martha. So I'm gonna focus um, not so much on Emily Dickinson, but on the story about how Emily's poetry actually came to the world. And Emily's poetry came to the world primarily through these two women, Mabel Loomis Todd and her daughter, Millicent Todd Bingham. Mabel was born in 1856, right here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where she spent the early part of her life. She moved to Washington, D.C. with her parents during her adolescence, but returned to Boston to attend the New England Conservatory, where she studied both piano and voice. After that, Mabel went back to DC to live with her parents in the late 1870s. And it was there that she met astronomer David Peck Todd with whom she fell in love and married and had their one and only child, Millicent, who was born in 1880. Very shortly after Millicent was born, David received an offer to return to his alma mater, Amherst College, and become a professor of astronomy there. And that is where Mabel's Dickinson connections began. When Mabel came to Amherst in 1881, she was very concerned because she had spent her entire life in more cosmopolitan areas in Cambridge, in Boston, in Washington, DC. And Mabel was concerned that the small college town, which looked very much like this at the time she arrived there, would prove too rural and too provincial for somebody like her who was greatly interested in the arts. But Mabel's fears were assuaged very quickly when she met Austin and Susan Dickinson. Now, as Martha said, the Dickinson family was very prominent in the town of Amherst. Uh, Austin 
was an attorney. He was also very involved in the civic life of Amherst. He was also an avid collector of art, a reader of literature, and a lover of nature. Sue was also a lover of art and a great reader. She turned their home into a, a sort of literary salon, inviting prominent artists, musicians, and intellectuals to come and dine at her table. And after meeting young Mabel, she soon took her under her wing and in fact introduced her to the poetry of her sister-in-law, Emily. The very first time Mabel Loomis Todd read one of Emily Dickinson's poems, she felt that though its style was quite strange and unconventional, it was, and I quote, full of power as she wrote in her diary. And then some other things started to happen in the world of the Dickinsons and the Todds. Mabel and Austin fell in love. Of course, they were each married to other people at the time, but that didn't stop them. And soon they were carrying on a torrid relationship that both of their spouses knew about. And so did a lot of other people, including Austin's sisters, Lavinia and Emily, who allowed the pair to have some of their assignations in the homestead, the family home. Now, after Emily died in 1886, her sister Lavinia found this enormous cache of poetry that no one really knew existed. I mean, Sue knew that some of the poems existed, Lavinia knew that some of the poems existed, but nobody knew the extent of them. And once Lavinia discovered these poems, she was determined to share them with the world. So she first turned to Susan, but when Sue did not move as quickly with this task as impatient Lavinia wanted, she moved on to ask Colonel Thomas Wentworth Higginson, the well-known abolitionist, Civil War hero and literary advocate, who'd had correspondence with Emily during her lifetime and actually met her on a couple of occasions. But Higginson felt that the poems written in such difficult handwriting and so very different from the poetic conventions of the 19th century, needed too much work, too much editing, and he was not willing to take on the task by himself. And so Lavinia then turned to Mabel, knowing that the combination of her considerable energies and talents, as well as her love for their brother Austin, would probably make her willing to take on this difficult task. And Vinnie was right. So Mabel did go to work transcribing the poems, um, and, uh, but she realized, so I'm actually gonna go back to the other slide with Higginson so that you can also see some of Emily's uh, difficult handwriting here. Uh, Mabel started to work on transcribing the poems and, um, but realized that in order to get them published would probably require the assistance of someone well-connected in the publishing industry. And so she also turned back to Thomas Wentworth Higginson and convinced him to become her co-editor in the, this endeavor. Several years later, the first poems, of, uh, poems by Emily Dickinson came out in 1880. Skip over to this slide. Uh, long before the term marketing was coined, Mabel Loomis Todd instinctively understood its principles. Now, clever publicists in the 21st century know how best to introduce a promising new artist to the public. There needs to be some pre launch preview by some well known entity with credibility. There have to be glowing reviews of the artist's launch, preferably many. And then to maintain the momentum, there need to be some carefully controlled and orchestrated information about the artist's release, not too much, um, and only certain types of information. Her image must be distinct. Get the artist out on talk shows, but make sure the producers know that they can only ask certain questions. Uh, Mabel actually understood this in the 19th century and did the 19th century equivalent of all of this. And so she was able to do the 19th century equivalent of getting the poems of Emily Dickinson to go viral, including designing this cover of the original volume of poetry in a way that she thought would be appealing to women whom she correctly believed would be the most likely people uh, to purchase this book. Mabel also went out on the lecture circuit and released the first book of letters of Emily Dickinson. 
So this is just what Mabel did. Now, here you can see again, one of the so-called scraps of Emily Dickinson's poetry. Um, not the easiest thing to understand perhaps. And Mabel Loomis Todd and Thomas Wentworth Higginson went through a complex and controversial process in editing the poetry, which was so radically different from 19th century poetic conventions. They did end up publishing two co-edited volumes of the poetry, one in 1890, one in 1891, each of which went through several editions. Mabel Solo edited a third volume of the poetry, which was published in 1896, and edited a two-volume set of Emily Dickinson's letters, which first came out in 1894. In the years since the poetry was initially published, the work that Mabel Loomis Todd and Thomas Wentworth Higginson did editing the poems of Emily Dickinson has been, to say the least, controversial because they did a lot of things to get the poems into a state in which they could be published in, at the time in, that they were. So they did things including changing Emily Dickinson's punctuation and capitalization to make it conform to 19th century standard. Sometimes they actually substituted words so that the poems would scan better. And perhaps most controversially of all, they gave titles to poems that originally bore none. Indeed, of the almost 1800 poems that Martha mentioned that we know Emily Dickinson to have written, the poet herself only gave titles to perhaps a, a dozen of them. Now, that part of the story is well known. Here's what's not so well known. After Austin Dickinson died, in a dispute over compensation for her work editing the poems and her general frustration with the surviving women of the Dickinson family, Mabel took all of the unpublished poems and letters in her possession, poems that numbered more than 600, threw them into a camphorwood chest and didn't speak of them for almost three decades. But in 1929, as the centenary of Emily Dickinson's birth approached, one summer up on Hog Island in Maine, where she had a summer home, Mabel looked up at her daughter Millicent from the hammock in which she lay and said, will you help me set it right? You see, Maddie Dickinson Bianchi, Austin and Susan's one surviving child, had been putting out her own editions of Emily Dickinson's letters and poetry and having publishers take Mabel's name off the older editions. To Mabel and to Millicent, this seemed like an incredible injustice, further injury to their long running battle between the Dickinsons and the Todds. Mabel asked Millicent to help her bring out a new edition of the letters of Emily Dickinson and to reclaim the quote unquote, right to define Emily Dickinson. Millicent, who was a geographer by training, in fact, the first woman to get a PhD in geography from Harvard University, uh, jettisoned her own promising academic career, retooled herself as an Emily Dickinson scholar and ended up writing four books on Emily Dickinson's life and poetry for which she eventually received two honorary doctorates for her work. And yet with as much as she knew about the idiosyncratic style and life of Dickinson, Millicent Todd Bingham worried to the end of her days that she lacked the proper credentials and would never be considered a true scholar within the academy. But the ways in which Mabel first and Millicent later work on editing, publishing, and promoting the poetry and the life of Emily Dickinson has indeed shaped the way that we think about Emily Dickinson today. Millicent in particular, I think, needs to be credited for saving the so-called scraps, these bits of poems, these little fragments of poetry, like the one you can see on the screen right now, um, that were not complete poems. And yet Mab uh, Millicent had the insight to know that there was genius even in these scraps and preserve them. Even though many of the decisions that Mabel Loomis Todd made throughout her career working on Dickinson have been challenged, um, I do think that it's important to recognize that a lot of Mabel's work is responsible for so many of the images of Dickinson that we have today on the stage, on screens, large and small, in art and theater uh, and other forms of literature. 
So I am going to stop sharing my screen now. And um, I think for a few minutes, Martha and I are going to ask each other a few questions and then we're going to each read a passage from our books. Then we'll it open up, up to you for some questions. So Martha, my question for you, uh, first question for you is, can you talk a little bit about how you first came to Emily Dickinson and her poetry? Um, uh, sure. Uh, in some ways, this is going to sound like I'm making it up, but I didn't. Uh, but I, I'm I'm not. Um, I I uh, first read Dickinson in high school, uh, in my junior year of high school, and this is uh, this is the part that that people can't quite believe. But I remember the day that uh, that I I first uh, read Dickinson. My teacher had us read Dickinson's great poem, "After Great Pain, a Formal Feeling Comes." Uh, and it was in this big anthology of American literature. Uh, I can almost see the cover. And um, I, that's a tough poem. And um, I'm sure many of your, uh, many of our viewers know it. And uh, I had that reaction that a kid has when you don't want the teacher to call on you. I, I slipped down in my seat and tried to bury my head. Um, but here's what happened in that moment and that I clearly recall. Uh, well, I couldn't explain the poem. Uh, I was a pretty lucky kid at, at 16. I hadn't known great, great pain. Well, I couldn't explain it. I could understand it. And uh, I, I think that's, that's one of the great qualities of Dickinson's work, that, that while you may not be able to explain every line, it still centers in you. And of course, Dickinson deals with the great uh, questions uh, of humanity that 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 pass from generation to generation, questions about love and faith and uncertainty, and and so uh, that grabbed me. That poem grabbed me, and I spent like the rest of my life really trying to uh, trying to understand uh, uh, why it did and uh, why her work so sustains me and. Um, and uh, that, that uh, conundrum of not being able to explain, but uh, being able to understand. How about you? Um, so I also first encountered Dickinson in high school as so many of us do and, and was fascinated by her poetry, but um, I, I, I sort of moved on to other things. And I was, I've always been an avid biography reader myself. And it was actually in reading biographies about Dickinson that I first encountered Mabel Loomis Todd. And the more I learned about Mabel, the more I became interested in her. Um, and then I found out that she had this equally remarkable daughter, Millicent Todd Bingham, about who almost nothing was known. Then I found out that nobody had written a full length biographical treatment of either woman and that there were more than 750 boxes of primary source mm -hmm. materials sitting in the basement of Sterling Library at Yale, where my oldest child had just started college. And so I thought, kind of kismet, you know, mm -hmm. here is a subject that I was interested in and a place that I wanted to have a good excuse to go visit. Um, and so that's how I launched into this. We both are such uh, creatures of, of archives. Um, what, what was some of the most, uh, most, most interesting ar archival finds for you? Oh, there were so many. Um, I guess one of the things that was, was sort of most emotional to me was finding uh, an envelope where uh, Mabel had preserved a lock of her hair along with a lock of Austin's. And that was a pretty amazing thing to actually just sort of pick them up and feel them in my hands. Um, and uh, there were, um, I guess there were, I, I had both the fortune, great fortune and misfortune of having these two subjects who almost obsessively documented their lives. And so I had both of them, for instance, kept both diaries and journals, uh, Mabel for 66 years and Millicent for close to 80. So. I mean, I really had, um, and I just had reams and reams and reams of insights into the daily thoughts and hopes and dreams of these two women. And, uh, and that, that was a pretty extraordinary opportunity to try to get inside the heads of 
of two people long dead. Um, so, you know, Dickinson, of course, is very different um, because we don't have those sorts of insights into her. And uh, one of the things that I find so remarkable about your book is that you, you just give us some of these insights into Emily by explaining the world in which she lived. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. You mentioned at the outset that when we think about Emily, we have to think about these two different worlds, the, her interior world that, that she had sitting in that room, looking out those big, beautiful windows of the homestead and looking west onto Main Street and, and the, the world outside of her house, her gardens and, mm -hmm. and the, the fields beyond the Dickinson Manse. And, how did you, how did, how did those things give you insights in, into Emily? Um, well, uh, let, let me, let me take the interior world first. Um, uh, as, as I mentioned, Dickinson wrote lots and lots and lots of letters. And the reason we have the letters is that after her death and once her work began to achieve some fame, um, scholars went out and, and collected them. And so the letters she sent to Thomas Wentworth Higginson, for example, he still retained letters she sent to her cousins. They were able to get their hands on. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have letters that others sent to her by and large. We have a few um, because they were burned upon her death. But the letters that Dickinson wrote, um, I spent an awfully lot of time with. And uh, um, I was familiar with them, of course, after having taught Dickinson for so long, but I realized I was, at least for writing my book, that I needed to read them in a slightly different way. I had previously let her read Dickinson's letters in terms of what she was doing. Um, as a biographer, you're always concerned with action. So I was looking for where she went, um, who she was talking to, that sort of thing. And then I realized that when you're talking about Emily Dickinson, action is not so much our conventional notion of that, walking, doing, seeing, but it's thinking. So I shifted my, my reading lens a little bit from what Dickinson was doing to what Dickinson was thinking. And when I did that and then began taking notes on, on what, what she was thinking, um, the interior world cracked open for me um, in ways that I hadn't, um, hadn't seen it before, hadn't, hadn't experienced it. Um, the external world, uh, I, I live um, seven miles from the Emily Dickinson house. I'm, my, my home looks out on the railroad tracks that her father, Edward Dickinson, uh, brought to town. I've lived here for 40 years. You know, I, I, I know the play of seasons here. And um, most importantly, I'm, um, I'm good friends with people who run the Emily Dickinson Museum in Amherst. And so I could uh, kind of tap my friends on the shoulder and say, hey, um, I'm writing a scene that deals with Emily Dickinson coming back uh, from being treated for her eye disorder in Boston. And the first thing she did, we know this because she wrote about it in the letter, was to go up into the attic and get the family's copy of Shakespeare and read it loudly in the attic. So I said, can I get in the attic? <laughs> and uh, um, so they said, sure, come on over here. So I spent, you know, like a, an hour, I climbed up into the attic and, and among the rafters, I had a copy of Shakespeare. I read it, I took notes. What, what is the light like? What is, you know, what it, it's changed slightly, but, but not uh, in profound ways. And I probably took uh, three pages of notes and spent an hour or more up there. And then that boils down <laughs> into the book to be, you know, a couple of sentences, something like that. But it was that verisimilitude that I really wanted to bring um, to the book to give a sense of, of M Emily Dickinson's world. I had a, a wonderful experience, a similar sort of experience and got to spend um, four hours sitting in Emily Dickinson's bedroom and just kind of watching the light change in the room, which I found to be just an extraordinary experience. And even though I had been in that house many times, I'd been in that room many times, but to actually have uh, that block of time and, and literally just to sort of watch the way the light shifted. And uh, although of course the trees are probably taller and different patterns than, than they were when Emily lived there. 
there, there was something quite magical about being in there and, and just seeing the play of light and the mm. shifting shadows and knowing that, that that was something that she also experienced. Martha, one other thing that I wanna pick up on from your book that I thought was really amazing was the, the way that you not only created uh, a, a visual scape of what Emily likely saw, but you also put together almost like a, a, an oral scape, you know, sort of list, being able to, to sort of think about the sounds that Emily must have heard, um, which is just, uh, I think, a pretty remarkable thing to sort of take out the noises of, you know, leaf blowers and lawnmowers and cars on the street. And how are you able to do that? Well, um, I'm a narrative nonfiction writer, which means I bring the techniques of storytelling, as, as, as you know, to, um, uh, to the, the narrative of the book. And, and uh, certainly when you're doing storytelling, you want to invoke the five senses. And uh, I think we're also visually oriented, at least I am when I'm, when I'm a writer. I just sit on myself, you know, and I say, okay, it, it employ some of these other, um, some of these other senses as well. So sound was, was, uh, was very important to evoking that. The train whistles, uh, the fact that she lived not very far from a hat factory, uh, the sounds of that, uh, the tolling of, of, uh, of clock bells, um, the sounds of muskets on the, the town common in the 1860s during the Civil War. So um, I just forced myself to, uh, to think about senses and uh, to try to um, bring as many of them that I could uh, accurately uh, assess and, and know that, that, that she heard um, to the text itself. Um, I'm, I'm kind of looking at the clock. Should we begin our, our readings now? Sure. All right. Um, and I think I'm, I'm, I'm going first. And I, I just thought of that because uh, the, the very brief section that I'm going to read um, has to do with some of those senses and some of that, that wider uh, uh, view of Emily Dickinson's um, world. My book, the subtitle is um, 10 Pivotal Moments in the Making of Emily Dickinson. Um, it is not a cradle to grave biography. I, I, I don't, didn't set out to do that. Other people have done it. Um, I didn't need to do it. But uh, Effie mentioned earlier on for nearly 20 years, I taught a, a seminar on Emily Dickinson in her house in, in the very rooms where, where she uh, wrote the poems. I, my Montreal students could come down on a free bus and, and, uh, on, and come right to the Emily Dickinson house. So it was very convenient. And I noticed as I was teaching that I uh, often wrapped a day's lesson about around a particular moment in Dickinson's life that was transformative, where she was um, different at 10 o'clock at night than she was at 10 o'clock in the morning. Uh, my students seemed to be enlivened by that, seemed to understand Dickinson better um, uh, than other, uh, other approaches um, that I took. Um, so I thought, well, if they seem to be ignited by, by this approach, I wonder if I could bring it to a book. So that's, that's indeed how my book came to be. I, I, um, um, I selected 10 very specific days uh, in Emily Dickinson's life where something happened, where um, a thought, an idea, a visit, something that should have happened that didn't um, uh, transformed her. The days are chronological but they're not consecutive. So the first day is when she's 14, she's writing a letter to a friend and I hear her literary voice for the first time. Second is when she's a, a student at Mount Holyoke Female Seminary. The, the day I'm, I'm going to read a very brief ex excerpt uh, from this morning is a day when Thomas Wentworth Higginson visited her for the first time. Julie mentioned earlier that Higginson um, uh, was a, a, a literary man, an essayist, um, uh, also an author, and uh, was the co-editor with Mabel Lumis Todd of the first edition of uh, the poems. Dickinson sent a letter to him when she was in her uh, early 30s after he had written a um, an article in the Atlantic Monthly, sort of an article about how to be a writer. But then for eight years, they never met. And uh, so in August of 1870, 
Um, finally, their, his schedule coincided. He was going to be in Amherst and he, uh, uh, he met Emily Dickinson for the first time. That evening, he sat down and wrote a letter to his wife talking about what that experience had been like. So that's where I get the quotes and uh, what, what, what he remembered. So um, I'm going to take you to that moment in August of, of 1870, um, uh, showing him moving from his hotel down to the Dickinson house and then uh, a little bit of what, what he heard. It, 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 his letter remains, his letter uh, recounting that that moment remains um, the most vivid portrait we have of what it was like to sit across from Emily Dickinson. So here, here goes. He knocked, presented his card and was ushered into a dark parlor in the left. Then he waited. First, he heard her. From upstairs on the second floor came the sound of quick light steps, footsteps that sounded like a child's. Then she entered. A plain woman with two bands of reddish hair, not particularly good looking, wearing a white dress. The white stunned him. I'm sorry, I keep getting these phone calls. All right. The white stunned him. It was exquisite. A blue worsted shawl covered her shoulders. She seemed fearful to him, breathless at first and extended her hand, not to shake, but to offer something. These are my introduction, she said, handing him two daylilies. Forgive me if I'm frightened. I never see strangers and hardly know what to say. Once they sat, Emily began talking and she did not stop. When I lost the use of my eyes, she told him, it was a comfort to me to think there were so few real books that I could easily find someone to read me all of them. She wondered how people got through their days without thinking. How do most people live without any thoughts, she said. There are many people in the world. You must have noticed them in the street. How do they live? How do they get the strength to put on their clothes in the morning? She was full of aphorisms, sentences that seemed to have been crafted earlier in her mind that she wanted to share. Women talk, men are silent. That is why I dread women. Truth is such a rare thing that it is delightful to tell it. Is it oblivion or absorption when things pass from our minds? At times, Emily seemed self-conscious and asked Higginson to jump in, but every time he tried, he was off again, and words tumbled out almost uncontrollably. He tried to recall every phrase, every thought, even her tone, humor, and asides. My father only reads on Sundays. He reads lonely and rigorous books. This then is a book, she ex exclaimed. She boasted about her cooking and said she made all the bread for her family, puddings too. The way she said puddings, when she said people must have puddings, sounded to Higginson as though she were talking about comets, so dreamy. Emily said her life had not been constrained or dreary in any way. I find ecstasy in living, she said. The mere sense of living is joy enough. When at last the opportunity arose, Higginson posed the question he most wanted to ask. Did you ever want a job, have a desire to travel or see people? The question unleashed a forceful reply. I have never thought of conceiving that I could ever have the slightest approach to such a want in all future time. Then she loaded on more. I feel I have not expressed myself strongly enough. Emily reserved her most striking statement for what poetry meant to her, or rather how it made her feel. If I read a book and it makes my whole body so cold, no fire ever can warm me. I know that is poetry, she said. If I feel physically as if the top of my head were taken off, I know that is poetry. These are the only ways I know it. Is there any other way? Emily was remarkable, brilliant, candid, deliberate, mystifying. After eight long years of waiting, Thomas Wentworth Higginson was finally sitting across from Emily Dickinson of Amherst and all he wanted to do was listen. Thank you.
It was lovely, Martha. Thanks, Kim. Thanks so much. So um, people usually ask me um, about what it was like for me to uh, come to know these two women who so obsessively documented their lives. And uh, so I thought I would read a short passage from the, the afterword to my book. Um, the afterword is called Sorting Through the Clutter. Getting to know Mabel and Millicent so intimately has also inevitably meant that I've had emotional moments along the way. When I came upon an envelope containing a lock of both Mabel's and Austin's hair, I held them in my hands and shivered, marveling at Mabel's impulse to preserve these bits of themselves together. When I tracked down several tapes of interviews Millicent had recorded and heard her voice almost a half century after she died, it was simultaneously eerie and yet oddly familiar because I had long had the sense of hearing her whisper in my ear. Her voice sounded exactly as I'd imagined it would. There was the time that I knew Austin was going to die before Mabel did. He was becoming weaker daily, irreparably ill. Her pitiful diary and journal entries show that while in some ways she realized that he would not recover, in others she was in complete denial. And then came the day, August 16th, 1895. Mabel wrote of her utter devastation. I sat there in the library, tears streaming down my face. A librarian came up to me and asked whether I was okay. Austin died was all I managed to blurt out. There was the moment I was sitting in the reading room at Yale, poring through Millicent's journals from France, documenting her slow and painful realization that in fact, Joe Thomas was lying to her and had been lying all along. Still, she continued to refute and justify what she saw. She didn't even wish to believe herself. Millicent, I wanted to shout out right there in the library, for someone so brilliant, you are so dense sometimes. And of course, there was the time that I read in Mabel's fall 1932 diary that she would write about the experience of seeing the last eclipse tomorrow. But with the omniscience that comes from being a historical storyteller looking back, I knew that there would be no more tomorrows for Mabel. When I walked out of the library entranced, the snow on the ground was startling because I'd been lost in an October of long ago. Darkness had already fallen and it felt like I was in another world. I was. Nice. So, Thank you. So I think Martha and I would be very happy to answer any questions that anybody has. Effie, would you like to ask the first question or shall I? Yeah, you have something on the comment uh, on the Q&A first, so go ahead. I do. Um, so first of all, thank you both so much. I love hearing authors read their books. It just completely puts me in the right space. So. Thank you both for, for reading those passages. Um, the first question in the Q&A is, was Susan Dickinson as careful or as prompt in editing and preparing the poems that she published? Uh, um, Susan, Susan didn't publish any of the poems and um, uh, she sat on them uh, when, when Emily first uh, uh, when Lavinia first uh, passed on a, a batch of poems, Sue sat on them for a long time. And I think that that's why she, Lavinia got um, a little itchy and decided to approach uh, Mabel and Miss Todd. Julie, uh, you you know certainly more about the- uh, Well, yeah, yeah, I mean, that's absolutely right. And the um, one of the interesting mysteries about Dickinson is that um, there actually were a number of her poems that were published during her lifetime, um, not credited to her. They were published uh, anonymously, a couple of newspapers. Um, and there are some scholars who actually believe that it, it was Susan who fed these um, <coughs> poems to newspapers, but we don't really know for mm -hmm. sure. So it, it is possible that Susan Dickinson was in fact responsible for the original publications of Emily Dickinson's poetry. 
Uh, but the, the first volume of poetry, which came out in 1890, was because of the editing of Mabel Loomis Todd and Thomas Wentworth Higginson, not Susan Dickinson. After uh, the poet's death, um, uh, Sue put pen to paper and, and she said, referring to those um, some dozen poems that were published during Emily Dickinson's life, that love turned to larceny. <laughs> and, and I think that's a, a rather apt phrase that said that, you know, she couldn't quite uh, stop herself, help, help herself. And uh, uh, seems like she had a hand in those. So I just want to remind people, I have questions in Q&A and in chat. If you can use the Q&A, it's a little easier for me to keep track of, but I will catch the questions in chat. So the next one is, who were Emily Dickinson's favorite poets? Uh, Dickinson was a widely, um, widely read reader. Uh, that was one of the first questions that Thomas Wentworth Higginson asked her um, in, in letters that they exchanged before they actually met. The Browning she mentioned, uh, uh, Keats, um, uh, she, you know, she read both contemporary works uh, as, as, as well as um, uh, writers who were much before her, probably her favorite writer was Shakespeare, I'd say. I would just add, um, again, when the pandemic has passed and we're allowed to travel again, one of the things I would really urge people to do as Martha has is to go visit the Dickinson Museum uh, in Amherst. One, one of the things that the folks at the Emily Dickinson Museum have been involved with over the past you know, dozen years or so is repopulating the library, both in the homestead and in the evergreens and uh, bringing back original volumes of books that we know the Dickinsons to have had there. And it's absolutely fascinating to look and see that the books that were in the house that Emily would have been exposed to and likely read. So many novels too. I mean, she was a great reader of, of novels of, of the Brontes, of George Eliot, um, not, not just limited to poetry. Another question in chat, Austin and Sue's house was not supposed to be a museum. How was that resolved? Uh, it is, <laughs> it, it, it is a museum. Um, I think that's but, uh, the question that it wasn't supposed to be. So how did it come to be? Um, uh, it, it's interesting, it didn't pass through very, very many hands. Um, when Austin and Sue, uh, uh, after they died, uh, they had one surviving child, uh, Martha Dickinson Bianchi, she lived there. Um, and then her male secretary, and then later his wife lived there. So, um, uh, this is a long story. I, I, I won't go into great details, but when I was a graduate student, I, I used to, um, I was a graduate student at, at uh, UMass Amherst and uh, studying Dickinson. And I, I used to walk by the, the Evergreens a lot. And uh, at, at one point, Mrs. Hampson, that was the, the wife of uh, Dickinson's um, niece, uh, uh, of, of her secretary, Martha Dickinson Bianchi's secretary, um, uh, came out, came tottering out on, on the, the sidewalk and invited me into the house. And I was just aghast, I'd never been in there. And it, it was like a time capsule. It was like uh, Austin and Sue had not um, uh, departed. <laughs> and uh, there were top hats uh, on, on, the, uh, on the pegs, um, uh, old furniture. And uh, so when the Emily Dickinson Museum was able to buy it, uh, they had, uh, they had the dilemma, you know, to preserve that authenticity or, or to uh, keep an eye of the future and to think about how, how they could preserve it for generations to come. And I think they, they've struck a happy balance. Um, it, it is, I think it still is like, like uh, walking into a time capsule. It is, and, and the folks at the Dickinson Museum have been um, putting a lot of energy and uh, raising a lot of funds to, to try to restore the evergreens as well as the homestead to, um, to better shave, to put in a fire suppression system there. But, but really in answer to the question, it, it, as Martha suggested, is actually a really long, complicated, fascinating story about sort of how the, the uh, evergreens 
came to be a museum. And, and it's also very much related to this question about how Dickinson's, uh, all the Dickinson artifacts, including the letters, the poetry, where they ended up um, with the, at Harvard, for example, there is a Dickinson room that has a lot of the original furniture from uh, the houses from both houses that they acquired um, and that they have there, including the piano that was in the homestead, the piano that Mabel Loomis Todd played when she came to visit there. And um, that was the piano that Emily heard upstairs in her bedroom. Um, and the, the story about why some of the things ended up at Harvard and some of the things ended up in Amherst is, is a fascinating story. Um, it is one that I tell in my book and it has a lot to do with the animosity between the Dickinsons and the Todds that went on for generations. Interesting. Has there been any attempt to take out the titles of Emily's poems or to capture the original form and words of her poems? Uh, lots of effort. <laughs> um, there, there have been many editions uh, of Dickinson's poetry since um, those the Todd Higginson uh, original volumes, and uh, most effort seems to keep going back further and further and further to the manuscript itself. And uh, uh, Ralph Franklin is is the um, one of the most most recent editors, and uh, there are even um, there's even an edition of, of Dickinson's poetry called the Manuscript Books of Emily Dickinson, which uh, are her original handwritten manuscripts. We forgot to mention the word fascicle, Julie, right. <laughs> and uh, maybe, maybe you want to talk a little bit about about, about that. Sure. So um, one of the things that that we know that Emily did with her own poetry was she sewed many of the poems together into little booklets um, that were in this desk that Lavinia found. And Mabel was the one we believe coined the term fascicle, which probably uh, sort of came from a, a botanical uh, uh, usage. Um, and uh, Martha's quite right that the, the contemporary editions of Dickinson's poems have really gone back as much to the original as possible and uh, Franklin and, and other editors have restored Dickinson's original use of capitalization and they've restored her use of, of, of punctuation. They've taken the titles off of the poems. And in fact, today, the, the way that we refer to most of Dickinson's poetry is not by a title, but rather by one of two numbering systems that were developed um, or by, by the first line of the poem. Um, thank you. It, it, I pick it, it up for a moment, Christine. That would be fantastic. Go right ahead. Thank you. Okay, uh, Martha and Julie, thank you. That wonderful. Uh, you know, in preparing for this program and inviting you, I spent a little time just talking to people and saying, "Oh, um, we have this program on Emily Dickinson coming up," and I'd ask people about her, and they say, "Oh, I know her name." So I'd say, "Well, what do you know about her?" And this was men, women, all ages. What was fascinating is how few people really knew very much about it. They remember reading us poetry in school. So this is so much of the mystique. And so this sort of works into a question that came in that particularly Martha, in your book, you talk about uh, Emily being somewhat of a paradox. You talk about her wanting fame and to be distinguished. And at the same time, she presents herself to us in this, this time in life as being somewhat isolated, uh, anonymous, maybe even shy. Can, can you and Julie help us to sort of understand this paradox and conflict and why she still seems to be so much of a mystery to so many people? Well, so many of the myths about Dickinson are intractable. Um, uh, and I, um, I always believe that the truth is, uh, is even richer 
than 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 some of those romantic myths. She was a paradox. I mean, she it can't be denied, you know, that 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 she lived the bulk of, of her life in her in her family's home. They had the economic resources to do that. One 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 might say it's kind of interesting to contrast Dickinson's life to, to people like the Brontes, for example, who didn't didn't have that that luxury. Um, but she uh, she as you said she she did think about fame. Um, uh, one of the chapters uh, in my book centers around a, a letter that, that she wrote to a cousin uh, where she was recounting a conversation that they had had um, the, the winter before. And she said, do you remember that morning when you and I in the dining room decided to be distinguished? It is a great thing to be great, Blue, she said to her, her cousin. And, um, so uh, I, for me, I, 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 I resolve that uh, um, reticence and that desire for fame um, by thinking that Dickinson wanted it on her own terms. She also said to uh, her sister-in-law, Sue, that she wanted someday uh, to make Sue and Austin proud a great way off. Um, Dickinson was a great reviser Poems never seemed to leave her mind. She was constantly working on them. I think she had a hard time letting them go. And to be in print, to be published, is to have it done, stamped, you know, it's out there in a particular way. Uh, Dickinson was constantly tinkering. And uh, I, I, think, um, I, 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 I think that desire for constant revision uh, of, of uh, never seeing a poem quite as finished was one of her hesitations. You know, she said, burn my letters. She didn't say burn my poems. She wanted them to be founded. So the, I, I think you're quite right in the question that, that Dickinson remains an enigma. And for all of the hundreds and hundreds of books and thousands of thousands of articles that have been written about Emily Dickinson, there's still more that we don't know and we probably never will. And I think that is part of her intrigue today. Martha, another question that came up was also in your book in that Emily Dickinson claimed that the use of me was not in reference to her. Can you explain that a little bit? What, what we understand about that? Yeah, that, that's, that's a wonderful question because it really gets at, at uh, the core of Dickinson. Um, in a letter to, uh, uh, Higginson, her literary mentor, he was asking her about that. Um, we can only infer his questions from the letters, but it seemed like he said, what do you mean when you say I? And Dickinson wrote back, when I state myself as the representative of the verse, I, it does not mean me, but a supposed person. And I think she's really, it, it was one of the most emphatic statements of her life. And, and I, I think she was um, claiming the right to an imagination, <laughs> uh, to be able to imagine something that she herself did not experience. And, and uh, you know, she was, she was saying that that is primary, that that is essential, uh, that a, a writer, a poet does not only write about um, their own lives, but they they can imagine and think and and don't want to be uh, you know hedged into um, just writing autobiographically. So I think she's in that statement. She's calling for the primacy of of the imagination. Julie, so I'll, come, go ahead. I'll come back to the Q and A with another question. Yep. Um, what made Higginson decide to help edit and publish Emily's work? What was the thing that convinced him? Uh, in a word, it was Mabel. Um, I think that she was an extremely charismatic woman. She, after, she knew that Higginson had already turned down the opportunity to edit the Dickinson poems, but she knew that she really wanted to have him as part of the team. So she went to Cambridge, she traveled to his house and Mabel brought with her a sheaf of poems and she did a dramatic reading of some of the poems. 
And it was in hearing them read aloud by this woman who herself was musical, was dramatic, um, was a beautiful woman. Uh, and I think it was the, the total package of her presentation that convinced Higginson that in fact, he, these, this, these were poems that really did deserve to be published. And so he basically said to Mabel, if you're willing to take on the transcription of the poems and send them to me in batches, and I want you to divide them up into groups, A, B, and C, the A's being ones that you think should definitely be published, the B's maybe should be published, and the C's probably not. Um, if you do all that work first, I will then help you with the editing and publication of these poems. Um, and Mabel was, and she did that. And I believe that is how she got Higginson on board. But, but it was also, of course, because uh, as you could tell from that, that amazing passage from her book that Martha read, that Higginson, the very first time he met Emily Dickinson was, was very intrigued by her. And he knew that he was facing genius. So he just wasn't worrying, willing to do the work himself uh, in, in the editing. So I think once he heard them read aloud, once he knew that he had this energetic young woman who was willing to do the heavy lifting in that, he was willing to sign on to the project. Julie, one of the questions that came to us, um, and you mentioned it briefly, that there were some 700 boxes that you went through. So the question was, is how do you maintain a focus over time going through 700, 700 boxes? Essentially, it's actually to both of you. How do you do your research? How do you stay focused when you've got so much material to go through to, to get to a book? Um, sure. Well, I mean, for me, it happened over many years, <laughs> several years of making trips to New Haven and to Amherst. Um, and uh, the, the, the good news was that even though there were 721 boxes at Yale, um, they're very well organized there. It's a, a delight to use the archives there because they're just so incredibly well organized. Um, and the, what, the way that I did it was um, because I had these diaries and journals, I decided that I would go through them first so I could learn about Mabel and Millicent's lives chronologically. And from those documents, I, I made notes to myself of the things that seemed to be important moments in their lives, the people who seemed to be important in their orbit and so from that, I was then able to use these exceedingly well archives pretty efficiently and start to say, well, I need to look at this set of letters or I need to look at, at these folders that had Mabel's talks or, or her drafts of the Dickinson poems uh, at Amherst or uh, a number of these other things. And, and in that way, I, I think I was pretty much able to, to stay on track and uh, keep myself organized and going through this enormous amount of material. There's another question in the Q&A. Um, is there a particular poem of Emily's that has really resonated with either of you this year, um, either offering insight, challenge, or comfort? Hmm. We can come I'm back. I'm taking to a long time, Julie, because I'm thinking. But <laughs> uh, uh, during during this year, um, well, I, you know, I I don't find a whole lot of comfort in Emily Dickinson because she's um, Dickinson is is always kind of uh, on on that that edge between. Um, doubt and certainty, faith and, and, and uh, uh, lack of faith. Um, I guess for comfort, uh, right now, one of the tried and true, uh, lots of people know, know this, this poem, the first lines are, I dwell in possibility, a fairer house than prose. Um, that, that, that poem has always 
uh, given me hope, given me a sense of uh, infinite possibility. Um, Dickinson for me was a little bit of a side note, but but Dick Dickinson for me so often seems to be writing about writing, and uh, I dwell in possibility is is one of those. You know, again another another poem about the imagination and its uh, infinite uh, infinite possibilities. That's one that came to my mind too. But also maybe hope is a thing with feathers. There you go. Yeah. Right. yeah. Um, so I, I, we also didn't mention that uh, the Emily Dickinson online archive. And so I just want to give a shout out to that. Um, the, uh, in 2013, um, Harvard put together this online archive, which was supposed to be one-stop shopping for all Dickinson fans, where they were putting together uh, Dickinson original manuscripts that they had in their collection. And they partnered with, I think, 10 or 12 other institutions that had Dickinson Holdings. Um, and uh, Amherst College had done uh, in its own digitization project a number of years earlier. And, um, but there are, there are these online resources um, where people can go and see original versions of the poems at, at Amherst College. You can see the different versions of the poems that, that uh, went through. Um, and there are there's some wonderful internet resources uh, that are out there, and because you do have such a, a vast, rich set of, of holdings um, that you can search for Emily Dickinson's poems uh, many different ways, and I think find inspiration in a lot of different places. I have a question, for both of you. Um, that came up, people talk about the fact that they love Emily Dickinson's <clears throat> poetry, but there are so many poems that they have a problem understanding that are mysterious. And the question was, is there a way to approach her poetry to help to understand it better? Or is it just as you sort of mentioned earlier in your childhood, Martha, just sort of grabbed you and it came to you? I'd, I'd say, don't worry about it. <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, unless unless you're in a class, I mean, you've got a teacher standing over you and uh, saying, explain, explain that line. Uh, you know, that was that was one thing I tried never, ever to do in, in, in my teaching of Dickinson to say, what does that line mean? Uh, I, I think Dickinson would be the first person in the world, uh, the first person to say, don't approach it that 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 way. So uh, some of them are inscrutable. And, and keep, keep in mind that we have um, all the poems that have been collected on Dickinson, not the ones that she considered her best, the most finished, the most polished, you know, so we have a, a, a wide variety of them. And, um, but uh, yeah, you know, I, I, and I don't mean to be flippant about that, but I, I, I do, um, but I do feel strongly that you should experience them uh, rather than to try to keep, rather than to try to grab to some understanding. They're slippery. Um, there will always be multiple layers. I think Dickinson is one of the most layered uh, poets around. Uh, so many multiple meanings. There's not one meaning uh, that 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 you're going to um, that 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 you're trying to seek. And I think that one of the amazing things about Dickinson's poems is that you can come back to the same poem at different times in your own life and read into it different layers, as Martha has so eloquently said. Ethy, do you have another question? Uh, no, but I wasn't sure if we had some comments or questions in that you're viewing though, so I was gonna take a break. <laughs> sure. So there's a question in the Q and A. Um, have any of the other photographs of Emily, apart from the one we know, been authenticated? No, not not uh, authenticated. Um, uh, there are two out there. Uh, one that was discovered not too many years ago, but um, no, you can't say for certain that they are that they are Dickinson. And I, I imagine others will turn up from from time to time. I think other um, other poems will will turn up. Um, as Julie mentioned uh, a while ago, uh, most of Dickinson's 
poems that were published during her lifetime appeared in uh, daily newspapers, primarily the Springfield Republican out here in, in Western Mass. Um, but it uh, copyright laws were, <laughs> were pretty non-existent back, back then. So um, editors in, in one town might see, uh, might get a copy of the Springfield Republican and see a poem in there and simply clip it out and put it in their newspaper. And, and I, I firmly believe um, that as the years go on, we'll know that Dickinson was read um, maybe in Cincinnati, St. Louis, uh, Madison, Wisconsin, uh, during her lifetime. I, I, I think those kind of discoveries will continue to happen. Going on a little bit with uh, Christine's comment, you mentioned that over many years, there have been many, many uh, collections of Emily's uh, poetry that have been edited and re-edited and changed a lot. Have you found at this point that you would recommend to our audience any particular edition that you feel is the truest to what we think Emily Dickinson wrote and how she wrote? Julie, do you want to? I mean, the Franklin is... is the Franklin, is... yeah. Well, I, I, I mean, actually what... I, I'm not a Dickinson scholar, honestly. Um, but I would say that to me, one of the most interesting things is, is not looking at um, any one edition, but looking at several, because I think it's really interesting to see how the poems have been evolved over time. And, you know, as we've tried to point out today, interestingly, one of the things that has changed over the years is that uh, editors of different editions of Dickinson's poetry have tried to get back to the original as much as possible. So, um, you know, we will we'll continue to see that. But I, I think Martha's right that Ralph Franklin's um, edition probably gets closest to it. Yeah, he, um, he came out with uh, uh, several different volumes in, in the 90s when he was kind of concluding his, his work on looking at the manuscripts and deciding uh, in his judgment what, what was the most authentic uh, version of each poem. And there is one book um, that uh, is Poems of Emily Dickinson edited by, by Ralph Franklin, uh, that if you wanted one, that, that probably would be the, the one to look at, Ralph Franklin. Christine, most of the questions that I've received have been pretty well covered through Julie and Martha's presentations. Is there anything left on um, the Q&A? I, um, well, I just want to make a comment about a couple things we put in chat and then as is typical, I have a question of my own. <laughs> <laughs> I always come up with questions. Um, but in the chat, I did put a link to the archive that Julie mentioned. And then one of our attendees mentioned um, a Dickinson lexicon, uh, the one at Brigham Young University, he finds helpful. So I posted that link in the chat as well in case anybody's interested in exploring in that direction. Um, and we probably have time for maybe one or two more questions if people put them into the chat or Q&A, but it's also okay if this is the last one. My question is, what do you think Emily would think of her reputation today, given that she was such a paradox with wanting fame, but being shy and timid? What do you think she would think of her presence in our culture today? Well, I think she'd be as astounded by it and, and uh, wouldn't think about it too much and would go, go back to her desk and continue to write. I think about a letter that Emily wrote to Mabel when uh, Mabel was traveling abroad in Europe and uh, Emily wrote her a letter that said, touch Shakespeare for me. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that she, she would think about that in the context of, of how well known she is today. She wouldn't be caught up by it. No. <laughs> she might like Twitter, you know? She really had that economy of, of words, but uh, that, that'd be about it. Was it true she actually had some, like 10,000 letters or something like that? Is that, what, is that a true? No, <laughs> that's, a, that's a rumor, <laughs> okay. Because somebody said, if she did that, I wonder what you'd do with emails. <laughs> <laughs> so we just got a flurry of questions in chat. I don't think I'll get to answer all of them. Um, this one's probably, um, 
I think Julie might be better for answering this one because of the focus of her book. Do you think some of the passions expressed in poems like Wild Nights could have been expired by Emily experiencing Austin and Mabel's love vicariously? Oh, well, that's gonna get us into some other major controversies in Dickinsonian land. Um, well, she, Emily was certainly well aware of the relationship between her brother and Mabel Loomis Todd. Um, as I mentioned, they did have some of their assignations in the house there. Um, who knows what they heard upstairs. Um, but th there also are questions that abound about passions in Emily's life. And you know, there are, for instance, these three highly stylized letters that are referred to as the master letters, which are, are deeply romantic, passionate letters. And there are a lot of questions about whether Emily actually wrote them to any one person in particular. Um, there are many theories out there about whether the, the, that person um, was Judge uh, Otis Lord, who would, had been a friend of Edward Dickinson's uh, and we believe possibly uh, had some sort of relationship with Emily late in his life, um, whether these letters were uh, written to Susan Dickinson, um, whether these letters were written to someone else or whether these were just letters that Emily wrote to no one in particular, but, but was playing with language and emotion in prose as she did uh, in her poetry. So um, I think there are many scholars who believe that Emily did know love herself, uh, but with whom she knew it is quite a source of controversy. And I think I'll leave it at that. I don't know Martha, if you want to comment at all. Well, I, I, I just say, if, if you start reading the poems autobiographically, you're headed down a, a, a wayward path. See, so, see it more as, as the products of her um, imagination. I'll end with one last question. Um, and this is probably a good one for Martha. Has there been an effort to preserve the Todd house in Amherst? Uh, people wish it had been preserved. Uh, I mean, it's still there. Um, it was a bed and breakfast for a while. It's now in, in, in private hands. Um, I've been in it a couple of times, beautiful home, but uh, no, it, it's not part of the Emily Dickinson Museum. I think a lot of people would like it to be, but uh, not, it, it is not. And, and an interesting story about that house too, that um, in fact, it was moved. Um, it was the original location of the house was across the street from where it is right now. Uh, and it, it did get moved and it got completely reoriented. Um, but one of the fascinating, and I've been in that house a number of times as well. And Martha's right, it's a lovely, lovely home. And um, I have been up to the, the room that was Mabel's bedroom there and sort of looked out and you can actually see part of the Evergreens, Austin's home from there. So uh, again, we don't know for sure because the trees are different. There are some houses that exist today that would not have existed in that time. But I like to think that the day that the, uh, the, the Dell, as Mabel called it, was originally built in its original location, that you could see all the way from Mabel's house to Austin's. Well, I would like to say thank you so much to everyone who attended this morning's brunch. Um, I hope that it was almost as much fun for you as it would be in person. I hope you enjoyed your um, food and drink uh, and the conversation as well. Thank you so much to Julie and Martha for the content of your presentation. You're both such engage engaging and knowledgeable authors and presenters. It was such a treat for me. This is the first Book Lovers Brunch that I've been able to host just from a scheduling perspective. Um, and it was, delightful. I'm so pleased that I was able to be part of it. 
So thank you both for your flexibility in adjusting to the virtual format and your flexibility in scheduling this um, and, and just for being here. This was really, really wonderful. And um, thank you to Ethi for letting me partner with you on this. I'm, I'm just thrilled to have been part of it. Thank you all uh, thank, for coming. Thank you again from the, and thank you from the friends to all of you. And just to remind our audience that the books, your books are available through the Concord Bookstore. And I just want to personally say thank you to Christine and the rest of the program department because Roshian from your publishing company came through somebody else, which came to us and which came. So it went down a long line, but we were so excited. And we uh, regrettably, we couldn't do with this in April when it was poetry month. But so now we'll make poetry every month. <laughs> and you brought Emily very much to life, to my life, and I think to many others. And so once again, from all of us, thank you. And thank you for all of us, uh, all of you in the audience for sharing your Saturday morning with us. Take care. Thanks. Okay. Bye, everybody. Have a Bye, great everybody. day.